CBC Here and Now. After four years and 14 billion, the Hebron platform is getting ready to go to sea. Housing prices continue their decline on the Northeast Avalon. Fishery pro protests from burning gear to a hunger strike, harvesters are taking matters into their own hands. And here in the weather department, boy, chilly, chilly temperatures. Uh, remnants of February is what it feels like out there, but we are warming up as we move over the next couple of days, a little bit anyway. The details are coming up. Well, a ceremony at the Bull Arms site today marked the end of the construction phase of this province's latest addition to the oil industry. The Hebron platform is almost ready to be towed 350 kilometers out into the Atlantic. And while today's christening on board marked an end, it also marked a new beginning. Here now, Sees Hare was part of a group of reporters invited to visit the platform. The focus today is on this structure behind me in the background. It marks the culmination of years and years of work. Four years, in fact. That's when construction started. And now, $14 billion later, the Hebron GBS is ready to be towed out into the Atlantic. Cut. Symbolic mooring chains, not ribbons, were cut marking the end of construction, a significant milestone. Grand in its engineering and complexity, there's a sense of pride over the newest engineering feat to enter Newfoundland's oil sector. There's pride in workmanship. It's finished on schedule, and there's pride in the safety record, too. 40 million person hours without a lost time injury. At its peak, 7,500 people were working on the project. The end of the construction phase means a new beginning is nigh. Hebron becomes the fourth oil-producing project in Newfoundland's offshore, joining Hibernia, Terra Nova, and White Rose. The province has an equity stake in Hebron and has to help pay for the project. But over the life of the project, the province expects to make over $10 billion in royalties and taxes. But the GBS does have facility to tie in additional wells and subsea developments if there are further oil fields found. While the construction phase of this project is over, there's still a lot of work to do. This 750,000 ton platform still has to be towed out to the ocean 350 kilometers away. The plan is to do that in May, weather permitting. Cease hair, CBC News, Bull Arm. Finance officials are providing more detail tonight on where they're finding savings as part of this year's budget. It comes after concerns that the cuts will have to come with big layoffs. Top officials briefed reporters and told them that's not the case. Here and now's Peter Cowan explains what he learned. In the House of Assembly, the opposition has raised a lot of questions about just how government is going to find $283 million in savings without laying off a lot of people. And after initially refusing to answer, well, the Department of Finance brought in reporters on Thursday and gave us this, 65 pages detailing just how it's going to save money through what they call zero-based budgeting, where each department has to justify every dollar that it spends. And here, let me give you a few examples. So, for example, the uh, Department of mineral development is going to save $1,500 through property furnishings and equipment or the language programs are going to save $1,200 by purchasing fewer services. These may seem like small amounts but together they add up to some substantial savings. Add that together with savings from cuts they made last year and officials within the department are backing up the finance minister's claims. They say that these cuts can be achieved with only a few job losses here or there as individual departments go through and find ways of saving or maybe of doing things differently. The one big question in all of this, though, is going to be health care. They've told that the health boards that they're going to need to cut about $20 million, and so far the health boards haven't figured out where those cuts are going to happen. That could mean people, but officials point out that's only 1% of their overall budget, so they think they will be able to find efficiencies, and they've been told that nothing they can do can affect the services they deliver for patients. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. 
Housing prices continue to fall in St. John's. Royal LePage says on average prices are down almost 2% in the last quarter. Prices for most types of houses are down on the Northeast Avalon, but condo prices are actually up. The company says while some are relieved by the provincial government's stay the course budget announcement and decision to stray away from civil service layoffs, there is simply not enough optimism in the market to uplift it from its current slump. Though we may see a slight increase in sales activity as the spring market gets underway until the region's economic prospects improve, market factors and price growth will remain constrained. A Memorial University student charged with the attempted murder of another student is being held for a psychiatric assessment. Police say the international students knew each other before the incident happened. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Police say the two university students got in a fight somewhere here on Signal Hill on the trail network. They say it happened late in the afternoon on April 7th and one of the two men left with what police called minor injuries. 28-year-old Masai Alabachi was charged with assault the day after the incident happened. But the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary said that while it was investigating the case, it found grounds to lay a more serious charge. Alabachi was in court yesterday to face a judge on an attempted murder charge. He's still in custody and is undergoing a psychiatric assessment. Alabachi studied in Iran before coming to Canada. He's studying engineering here at MUN. A university spokesperson says it's a difficult time and support is being offered to the accused student and his alleged victim. Munn says it believes no one else at the university is at risk in relation to this incident. The Memorial University student who was charged is due back in court early next week. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. A St. John's man has been sentenced to five and a half years in prison for a vicious attack on a woman last May. Walter Howell had pleaded guilty to aggravated assault. Glenn Payette reports, but first a warning, there are graphic details in this report. Using a stick, Walter Howell pummeled one of his neighbors in her home off Ricketts Road in St. John's. We don't know how long the attack lasted, but when it was over, her scalp was partially torn off. Repeated blows to her back caused her lungs to be punctured and a finger was left dangling off. She would spend two weeks in hospital. She needed staples to repair her scalp and close the wounds to her back. Her finger had to be put in a cast. She told the police Hal had come to her home and asked to use the phone, and then came up to her in the kitchen and began the assault. She asked him what he was doing, but he didn't answer and just kept hitting her. She told the police she doesn't know why the attack happened. Hal had been charged with attempted murder, but it was dropped when he agreed to plead guilty to aggravated assault. In the agreed statement of facts, Hal admitted to the assault and was given five and a half years in prison. He was also given 17 months credit for time served. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. A strongly worded decision by the Court of Appeal between Andrew Abbas and Western Health and its psychiatrist, Dr. Talpern, in defense of political dissent. Abbas was appealing over an incident where he was detained against his will in a psychiatric unit after his angry tweets over Don Dunphy's death. The Court of Appeal wrote, if anger about political events and words of defiance to authorities are dealt with as signs of mental illness, warranting involuntary committal, then our society is in a dangerous place. The court continued with, as the history of authoritarian societies has taught us, confinement in a mental institution is a particularly insidious way of stifling dissent. And the Court of Appeal asked a couple of questions. Did the police intend to stifle dissent or intimidate? And did the doctors do just what the police asked them to do? Despite all of the efforts that had been made at fighting the legitimacy of discriminating against people with mental illness who are hospitalized or not, as well as reducing stigma, which is another way of, of talking about discrimination, uh, there's still a great deal of it. And when people are hospitalized, they are judged. Uh, and they are found to be, by common people, to be less credible. Therefore, if you place a person in a psychiatric hospital against their will, it renders whatever opinion it was they were expressing to be less apparently valuable and likely to be listened to. And 
Coming up in about 25 minutes, my full interview with Mark Grushy about the issue of mental health versus political dissent. Fish harvesters from the Northern Peninsula burned crab and lobster pots during a protest this morning outside the Department of Fisheries and Oceans office in Port Schwa. They say recent cuts to shrimp and crab quotas means they don't have access to enough fish to make a living. The protesters say the gear is of no use to them because they can no longer afford to fish. Organizers say there will likely be more protests. And there is another protest happening now outside the Department of Fisheries and Oceans headquarters in St. John's. Richard Gillett, the vice president of the Federation of Independent Seafood Harvesters, is in his fifth day of a hunger strike. We'll hear from him in about 25 minutes. A St. John's Women's Center, uh, shelter that is, showed off some newly renovated activity rooms in its facility on Waterford Bridge Road today. The renovations were donated by a fundraising group formed in memory of five-year-old Quinn Butt. Iris Kirby House has redesigned its activity rooms to be more inviting for young children, teens and their mothers. Adam Stead of Quinn's Place donated the money to pay for the renovations. Three rooms were redesigned to be more welcoming for women who stay at the facility. Quinn's mother, Andrea Goss, says she is proud the work was done in her daughter's name. Quinn's father is accused of killing the five-year-old and then burning down his home. Goss says she wishes she knew about Iris Kirby House when she was searching for an escape. I had Quinn and I left home numerous times and just drove around and had nowhere to go. And of course, I could go to any of my friends or families, but embarrassed and ashamed to go, um, not knowing that this facility was here with, you know, uh, the way it is and a t I've been on a tour last year and it's, it's just so comfortable and and beautiful here and there's there's people here to help you and talk to you. Well, this beauty burg had people heading to Fairyland in droves over the long weekend. It's attracted watchers from all over the province, including some who took to the air in a chopper to check out nature's bounty. Locals say the iceberg is grounded and is unlikely to depart, depart anytime soon without a major change in wind direction, though they did say parts of it have broken off in the past few days. In St. John's were given the opportunity of a lifetime Saturday at the RBC training ground in St. John's. The regional qualifying event for athletes aged 14 to 25 is one of several across the country. Athletic hopefuls got advice and critiques from an Olympic athlete and competed in four key areas, speed, strength, power and endurance. One MUN track and field student hopes to move on in the competition. What's going to happen, they told us, is about a week from now they're going to email us um, kind of like a portfolio or like a, yeah, like a portfolio of everything uh, and how we did and how we stack up to each other. And then in that they'll give us a, a date for when they'll send, send an email invite for, uh, for the actual finalists. So it's the top 100 athletes from the seven events in the Atlantic region that go to the finals. Musician Sherman Downey has received an overwhelming amount of public support after his two guitars were stolen last week following a show in Fredericton. Lots of people want to help Downey raise money to replace the instruments, but Downey didn't want to accept handouts. Instead, he wants to earn people's support with a free online show. He's planning a Facebook Live performance on April 23rd. The online concert will be free, but it's tied to a pre-sale order campaign. It'll work like like this, during the two-hour window of the online performance, people can purchase advance copies of Downey's next album at no set price, so you can pay as much as you like. Revenue raised from those sales will help Downey replace the guitars. And the online show is uh, happening on Sunday, April 23rd, as I mentioned, at 8 p.m. Newfoundland time. And you can check it out on the Facebook page, Sherman Downey Music. A year after the massive wildfire that threatened Fort McMurray, many firefighters are facing lingering health problems. 355 firefighters who helped battle flames to save the city last May were questioned by researchers from the University of Alberta. 
One in five of them report persistent respiratory issues like coughing or wheezing. One in six of the firefighters report mental health issues like anxiety or depression. The researchers want to expand their study and track the firefighters' health long term. Well, that's uh, yeah. uh, disturbing. Again, definitely, yeah. but uh, why their uh, job is one of the most difficult, mm -hmm. for sure. Absolutely. Well. Hard gonna, right turn? Yeah, yep. hard right <laughs> turns. Time of year when a lot of people are turning their attention to hockey. Yes, yeah. and there is definitely no shortage of reasons in this province. First and foremost, foremost of course, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Hey. The blue <laughs> uh, hard to believe what this team is doing, even <laughs> for is. me. Uh, I said it would take a miracle, but uh, these Matthews young players so have a lot of people talking. Uh, the big three rookies, uh, the Leafs really we're expected to win, you know, one, maybe two games against the league's hottest team, the Capitals, but they are boasting a 2-1 series lead. They've accomplished this with two straight overtime wins. The next game tomorrow night in Toronto, and until they are done this series, I'm going to wear either a blue tie or a blue suit every day this week in my support for the team. <laughs> So many of you hockey players are superstitious. <laughs> I'd say go for it. Absolutely. <laughs> Blue. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's uh, go to our local players, the St. John's Ice Caps. The last regular season AHL game at Mile One came down to a win and you're in situation. Mm -hmm. The Ice Caps needed two points to guarantee a playoff spot. And with a near capacity crowd on hand, the Ice Caps were fired up to start the first period. Team points leader, Harry Chris. Terry started the scoring with his 29th of the season. To the second now, uh, with the Ice Caps up 2 nothing, All-Star goalie Charlie Lingren makes an amazing poke check <laughs> save on a breakaway by Marley's left winger Brendan Leipzig. A little later, Charles Hooden set up Terry for his 30th gold. A goal, rather, passing Eric O'Dell for the franchise record for goals in a season. The Ice Caps, they're going to face the Tampa Bay Lightning's Farm Club, the Syracuse Crunch, in the best of five first round series. Game one and two, mile one center this Friday and Saturday, 7.30. And you know, there is just so much hockey to talk about. Other big hockey news in this province, the Grand Falls Windsor Cataracts are national senior hockey champions, winning the Allen Cup Saturday by beating the Lacoon Generals 7-4 to four in Boutouche, New Brunswick. Uh, the win marks the third time in the tournament's history that a team from Newfoundland and Labrador took home the trophy. Big congrats. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> it's a proud moment for me. I, uh, I uh, certainly uh, been a cataract fan for so long and, and uh, I was so proud, so proud of the guys on, uh, on Saturday and to see them on TSN. And, and then, of course, uh, you know, put the icing on the cake uh, to have uh, Ron McLean and, and Don Cherry uh, uh, mention our mayor and, and, and George Scott. And I mean, that's, that's a, a proud moment. And, a national exposure for free. I mean, can't get many better than that, can you? That's great stuff. And as you mentioned, that uh, was enough, uh, that win, to, uh, to land them a special mention on Coach's Corner uh, later that night. Have a look. So, Don, we were at Rogers Hometown Hockey. It was in Grand Falls, Windsor, Newfoundland okay. this year. And the mayor, Barry Manuel, threw a party after the show. We haven't had that, uh, like, not this big anyway. We had live music. We had some pops. We had an unbelievable party. And Did I you know get drunk? I, don't, I might have, but uh, no, not, don't say that, but I, I might have got oh. a little glow on. Um, this is a Good big dog. party coming in Grand Falls, Windsor, and you deserve it. The Cataracts have won the Allen Cup, and let's show you a couple of the highlights of this game. I know we both love, you love this especially. Well, these I guys, do. These guys play for, they got to get up in the morning. Evan Oberg, yeah. bang. Then here it is again. Colin Cercelli, bang. bang. Another one for Cercelli, and there was three in this game from Stuart McRae, who McCray set up the got, We didn't get goal. any of his goals. Sorry, Stuart, but... We do have Mike Brent and at the very end. These guys play for the love of the game. And they, I love putting this on the Allen Cup. There's no better guys in the world. And they play. And there's Mike Brent right there. The, they put it up there, boy. I'll tell you, boy, there's no better guys in the world than guys that play for the Allen Cup. They have to do it. And it's a big deal to me and most hockey guys. Tom Coolen's the coach. George Scott's the play-by-play -play guy. I don't know if you remember. I think you mentioned him. He was a sharp dresser, came on the telecast that night. So uh, congratulations, Grand Falls, Windsor, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Perfectly centered on the coach's card. Just taking you on. 
Could previously promised long-term care facilities in Central be public-private partnerships? We'll take a look at that question after the break. And later, we head to Bull Arm for a close-up look at the massive Hebron oil platform that we'll soon head out to sea. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. I'd like to order up a few more Easter Sundays, oh, yeah. please. That was glorious. Everybody, yeah. certainly in this area, was outdoors. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a little back to reality today yeah. in terms of the uh, the roller coaster that is spring. In fact, today, uh, daytime highs were pretty much where they should be in February uh, oh, across the no. island. Uh, yeah, so, and in fact, we woke up to record-breaking temperatures this morning, not only in Labrador City, Wabush, uh, but also Gander and Corner Brook. And you look at how long the, some of these weather stations have been recording uh, data from the 30s and 40s. So uh, a long time uh, to record data. And this is the coldest, some of the coldest temperatures we have seen on April the 18th. In fact, record breaking for this April the 18th and a handful of spots you see there. And Gander also set a record for the coldest daytime high on April 18th. Uh, the high there in the minus three range of minus four. It was the uh, 
was the high. In fact, uh, for uh, uh, much of central Newfoundland, minus three to minus four, minus five in Daniels Harbor, and you can see the highs across Labrador in the minus one to minus two range. So yeah, a little warmer even for inland parts of Labrador than it was on the island. The daytime sunshine helped there across the big land. Note the northerly flow that's just been keeping temperatures very chilly here across the island. Current temperatures, if you are headed out uh, this evening and you haven't been out yet today, you're going to want to bundle up. Still in the minus 3 to minus 5 range across the central and eastern Newfoundland. That's where the cloud cover is going to continue to dominate tonight and in through the early stages of tomorrow as well. Big area of high pressure coming in, coming in from the west. The northerly flow around that. The other big weather maker this week is well to the south, almost south of the Azores Islands, but uh, a little bit further to the west. Uh, but this low is is going to be a pretty key player as we move over the next couple of days. It's going to be throwing some moisture uh, towards our neck of the woods and with the cold air in place that will set up the potential for some snow, some ice pellets, some freezing rain and even yes, some rain as we move into the Thursday Friday time period. Eastern Newfoundland Central uh, on the uh, menu here as well. Here's how it plays out. There's the high that will move in tomorrow. A pretty quiet Wednesday overall and then this line of precipitation, this trough line will get a push uh, thanks to that system coming in, uh, edging its way in a little bit from the uh, south and you'll note that that precip will then back its way into Newfoundland for Thursday. Again, some snow, some ice pellets, some freezing rain, some rain all possible here uh, for eastern and central Newfoundland uh, lingering into Friday and then slowly but surely clearing out of uh, central on Friday. But we'll talk more about that in your long range forecast details coming up. Let's detail tonight and tomorrow for you. I'd still have the school bus there. I know many uh, kids, uh, if not all, are off this week for Easter week. But uh, here is what it will look like tomorrow as you start your day. Minus four in St. John's to uh, minus nine and ten central towards minus twelve from Cornerbrook up through uh, central parts of Labrador, minus 16 in Cartwright, and a little bit cloudier, minus 14, with a bit of a southerly wind starting to kick into Labrador City. Generally quiet, flurry chances, again, from the northeast coast down across the Avalon and towards the Buren Peninsula. Those flurry chances, for the most part, are in the morning. I think we'll see a, b a better uh, chance of seeing sun breaks tomorrow than we had today from Gander down towards the Avalon and the Buren Peninsula. Temperatures here as warm as three degrees out of those onshore winds, as cool as minus one if you're right along the coastline and in the Bonavista region. And note as you work your way to the southwest coast, the west coast, we're going to find some three and four degree temperatures. Winds are light, some nice April sunshine in the mix there, and temperatures again closer to the freezing mark across Labrador for tomorrow as well. And note that uh, flurry chances in the clouds thickening up in Lab West. We'll walk you through that long range forecast right through to the weekend coming up. Carolyn? Thanks, Ryan. Well, provincial cabinet ministers are crossing the province trying to sell this year's budget. The Minister of Transportation and Works was in Grand Falls, Windsor today, where he was asked about long-term care beds promised to the region. Here and now's Chris Ensing has more. The conference room, pads of paper, yep, it's budget season. Minister Al Hawkins said this year's is, as you've heard before, fair and balanced. But there was something new about something old. In 2015, two long-term care facilities were promised to central Newfoundland. 120 beds will be split between Gander and Grand Falls, Windsor. These facilities will be privately built, owned, and operated, according to the then Conservative government. Last January, the Liberal government cancelled requests for proposals that included P3 options. Now, today, Hawkins said that the government is looking at all options, and that includes a public-private partnership similar to what's happening in Cornerbrook. Whether that model will work for central Newfoundland, we're not sure. Uh, again, it's, it's every, every project is uh, based on the value for money that's done to determine uh, whether it's better to go the old traditional way or to, to, to go the P3 model. So that's something we will be looking at. Uh, the exact numbers and size of the uh, long-term care facility in, in central Newfoundland will be, uh, you know, will determine exactly that. Hawkins said that an announcement will be made soon on how the government plans to approach building these two facilities, but that will likely just tell us how they want to build the long-term care facilities because this year's budget only includes four and a half million dollars set aside for increasing long-term care capacity west of the Avalon. Chris Hensing, CBC News, Gander. Tree. No five full days without food. After the break, we'll check in on a union leader who's staging a hunger strike in St. John's over fish stocks.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, fisherman and reality TV star Richard Gillett is going into his sixth day of a hunger strike. The vice president of Fish NL has set up camp outside of DFO headquarters in St. John's. He says he won't eat again until he gets a meeting with federal fisheries minister Dominic LeBlanc, and he wants an independent review done to look at the relationship between DFO and the Fish, Food and Allied Workers Union. Jamie Fitzpatrick from the broadcast spoke with Gillett earlier today. But to do this as a hunger strike, I mean, isn't it kind of a way of saying you guys have to meet my demands or if you carry this all the way through, uh, you're kind of saying if you're going to carry it all the way through, you guys have to meet my demands or I'll kill myself. Is that is that a fair way to negotiate with anyone? Well, we've been going through this for years, OK? Uh, I've been at this fishery now for 32 years. And uh, anybody who knows me that I'm an aggressive fisherman, I start fishing in March and I don't stop until December. And whatever species is out there to fish, I fish. But there's a reason I'm on this bank today, is I have no fish to catch anymore. I haven't got enough fish to make a living. And I'm a fifth generation fisherman, and I'm going to be the first one out of all my family, the fifth, the fifth generation to be pushed out of this fishery by something other than a wage. And I'm not prepared to let, let the 500 years of history of Newfoundland and Labrador go. And that's how strongly I feel about it. I'm not only fighting for myself, I'm fighting for the next guy that's next to me. And somebody has to say, enough is enough. And we're to that point that we cannot, taking 62% cuts in one year, taking 50 odd percent cuts in another year, uh, in, in tree out of crab. We've been in uh, tree K, we went from 175,000 pounds of crab down to 24,000 pounds of crab. What can we make a living at? When the head of science tells you he cannot give you any species around Newfoundland and Labrador, he cannot give you any species that's prosperous. How can we continue on this road that we're on and still pay the bills, pay the, the wages of the crew? We can't do it. With, uh, you take management, you tell me that you're managing something that from one year to the next you've got to take a 62% cut or a 50% cut in crab? You know, you almost think you would see this coming. And I've had comments from, from uh, uh, scientists that they said, you guys, your fish harvesters, will probably see it two years before we do. So if you tell me that that's good science, it's, it's totally unacceptable. I think a lot of people who agree with you don't necessarily think that what you're doing here is going to get us any closer. Well, I beg to differ. And I'm taking the stand. And this is my stand. And I hope the minister's listening. Because my resolve is there's only one way that I'm going to move off this bank. It's whether he meets demands or I goes off in something else because enough is enough after the break we get reaction to a court ruling that defends political dissent the decision involves the case of a man who was put in a psychiatric unit against his will after he tweeted some angry comments following Don Dunphy's death. Stay with us.
Buster Memorial in Cornerbrook against his will. This after he voiced anger on social media two days after Don Dunphy's shooting death. The RNC detained Abbas and doctors signed the papers to commit him. Abbas claimed he wasn't mentally ill and he challenged it in court. Mark Grushy is a lawyer and mental health advocate. I spoke with him today. So Mark Grushy, when you read this decision, uh, what stood out for you? What stood out for me was the, uh, I guess, the tradition of uh, common law court systems like our Court of Appeal in standing for the right for people to engage in politically dissent and not be labeled as mentally ill and or confined as alive and well. Uh, that uh, tradition and approach has been active in common law jurisdictions for many years and it's, I'm very happy that it's healthy and alive uh, due to the fact that there are you know, clear countervailing forces active in our culture today that don't appear to grasp the significance of that protection for people as a whole. I was really happy to see that. Uh, our courts obviously need to be standing in protection of our democracy and, and so forth, and that's exactly what I took that to be. One of the quotes, um, very strongly worded, um, that confinement in a mental institution yes. is a particularly insidious way of stifling dissent. Yes. As a mental health advocate, uh, what do you think of that? It's absolutely true. Um, despite all of the efforts that have been made at fighting the legitimacy of discriminating against people with mental illness who are hospitalized or not, as well as reducing stigma, which is another way of, of talking about discrimination, uh, there's still a great deal of it. And when people are hospitalized, they are judged. Uh, and they are found to be, by common people, to be less credible. Therefore, if you place a person in a psychiatric hospital against their will, it renders whatever opinion it was they were expressing to be less apparently valuable and likely to be listened to. And so that's the issue of stigma. Absolutely. Once they're labeled like that, yes. they, then they don't have the same access as other people? Exactly. It, it, people will stop listening. And what you see happening in places like China and Russia and North Korea, Iran and so forth, to this day, the psychiatric system is used in those countries as a method to stifle political dissent on a routine basis, to the point that it is invited uh, you know, formal complaint from governments like Canada directed towards China and so forth. In China, they're fond of doing it to human rights lawyers, for example. Now, the, uh, the Court of Appeal also mentioned, uh, well, they asked a couple of questions, not that they were answering it, but they posed the questions. Yes. Did the police intend to stifle dissent yes. and, or intimidate? And did the doctors do just what police asked them to do? Right. What What's your analysis of, of what they're getting at here? Right. Well, they're concerned, I think, about what was actually happening, which they're not sure of at the current state of things, but they're concerned about it because that's always the risk with ascribing too much power to an institution like psychiatry, for example, that can define whatever it wants to define as a mental illness to be acted against. And what you need to appreciate is that the focus of the legal system is to protect and preserve rights and to ensure things happen in a very predictable and repeated way. The focus of the medical system or the psychiatric system is to bring about cures or changes in behavior. They're very different focuses, you see. So the legal system exists to remain the ultimate decider of these things, to not allow some other group to decide who is detained and not. And the very concerns that are raised are exactly the things that happen in other countries that are used to facilitate suppression of people politically. You're involved with the uh, Mental Health Coalition, yes. uh, co-founder, yes. I presume that's yes. the title. Yes. And um, what do you think a judgment like this from the Court of Appeal does to the dialogue about mental health going forward? It's extremely important because there are many, many people. The history of the interaction of people who are deemed to have mental illnesses and mental health concerns and the state for, for many, many generations has been extremely systemically violent. It's been very negative, it's done a lot of damage, and we are only beginning to wake up from that negative period. We also have great challenges to the justice system broadly in terms of its perceived legitimacy in the face of cases like we've seen in this province recently that aren't even associated with mental health. When something like this is said, it should remind people that at the end of the day, the court exists to protect people's right to be themselves, to believe what they want, to say what they like, to protect their freedom of expression, and therefore to protect not just those who are deemed to have mental illness who do not, but also to protect people who have mental illnesses. 
uh, concerns about abuse of state power against people who have mental health concerns are very, very, very common. Uh, I, I know a great number of people who are extremely concerned about this, and any restatement of the need to protect people from arbitrary power is ex extremely helpful and, and supportive. And I know a great number of people are very happy with this. So right. it's great to see it. Um, and it should be a true sign that uh, there is health in our democracy. Absolutely. Mark Grushy, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, it was a cold one today. Yeah. Uh, is it going to just stay like this forever? Well, no, not forever. <laughs> it feels like it. Not, not forever. That's like not it. very comforting. <laughs> That's your forecast. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a chilly one today, and you feel for those who have to work outside because yeah. uh, they do get some bonus days this time of year, but more often than not, it's a raw day like this. And uh, speaking of having to work outside, here is something you don't see every day, carrying uh, transmission towers. Wow. Uh, yeah, the chopper there. Yeah, it's part of a new transmission line that'll run from Bay to Spare to Chapel Arm on the Avalon. Interesting. Uh, this upgrade will enhance the reliability of the current transmission network originally built in the late 1960s and it's uh, scheduled to be up and running uh, by next winter. That's a big chopper. Wow. Next winter. <laughs> it feels like it's just around the corner. <laughs> Okay, try to, try to make something okay. happy or nice yes. about this. Okay. Some good news. Yeah. There must be you some know, sunshine Yeah, or that's something. right. And there is a little more sun in the way for Wednesday. Uh, certainly brighter than it was today. Cooler temperatures are certainly going to prevail, but we're not quite as cold as we were today, uh, where temperatures really bottomed out in terms of daytime highs. A wintry mix, though, Thursday into Friday for eastern and central parts of Newfoundland, certainly keeping an eye on that. And look at current temperatures all the way across Atlantic Canada. Even Halifax is just at three degrees right now. Uh, Greenwood, Nova Scotia at four, Montreal just at nine. Uh, again, uh, everything swirling around this big area of high pressure that's uh, building into the region, but the northerly flow around that is what's keeping us chilly. Our weather player for the rest of the week is going to be uh, not only this high, but this low backing in from the southeast, it will increase the cloud cover, not tomorrow, where we're going to be seeing, again, a bit of an onshore flow, keeping the cloud cover thick, but some sun breaks in the mix for the northeast coast, St. John's, down towards the Buren Peninsula. There is that risk of a flurry in the morning, but generally uh, we are uh, looking at a brighter day than today and temperatures warmer for the south and west coast. We'll get up to plus two in Happy Valley. Goose Bay should be riding the freezing mark in Labrador City. So this low will back the precip in slowly but surely to Newfoundland as we roll throughout the day on Thursday. I think we'll see a little bit of snow into the afternoon over to a bit of some ice pellets and then freezing rain and then finally over to some rain, especially for uh, areas right along the coastline. I think the potential here for freezing rain lingers uh, right through Thursday night and into Friday for inland and uh, higher elevation areas and where we're going to be seeing temperatures hovering around the freezing mark. This will be a tricky forecast that we'll have to nail down in more detail over the next 24 hours. There's your Thursday afternoon temperatures plus one in the east that uh, snow possibly arriving as early as the evening for central, but overall Thursday looking quiet there. Sun and cloud mix for western with a plus four and two on the plus side with some scattered wet flurries rolling across the big land. And there is that uh, front that will be moving through there as well. Uh, note as we roll into Thursday night and Friday, that snow chance moves into central. I think either some rain, freezing rain, some drizzle possible across the Avalon and eastern parts of Newfoundland. Again, temperatures just riding that freezing mark. So this will be one we'll have to keep an eye on. But certainly into the Friday time period, this will start to depart from central. We'll see some clearing there, but a still continuing unsettled day in St. John's with the freezing rain and rain risk. As I mentioned, five degrees for western parts of Newfoundland with sun and clouds scattered flurries for eastern and western parts of Labrador. You wanted something positive, Debbie and Carolyn. And well, it is a typical six, seven day trend. It is always better at the very end, uh, <laughs> but it is there. And certainly Monday into Tuesday of next week, forecast model showing a bit of a pattern change where we could get into some warmer air. Uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. Until then, uh, it's the doldrums of spring here across uh, Nice Eastern. and sunny in the West Coast. Though. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, the West is seeing at least some sun, not beautiful temps, but bright. And then Labrador, uh, a lot of folks saying they'll keep the cold for as long as they can because it's keeping the flies away. <laughs> Literally, that's what they're saying on my Facebook Fair page. Enough.
Okay, let's meet our young athlete of the day. And this player is from Logie Bay. Yes, nine-year-old Noah Malone plays defense for the Northeast Eagles Adam Warriors. Way to go, Noah. You're today's young athlete of the day. After the break, we'll give you an up-close look at the massive Hebron oil platform that's ready to head out to meet the lands offshore. Welcome to Here and Now. Back now to our top story, the completion of the Hebron oil platform. After four years and $14 billion, the next engineering marvel of the local oil industry is set to head offshore. The 350 kilometer move is weather dependent, but could happen anytime after May 1st. Two, three, cut. So we're here today to celebrate the completion of the Hebron platform. We've been building it here at Bull Arm since 2013 and uh, this is a fantastic day for everybody who's worked on the project to come to completion. And so in the month of May we'll be towing the platform 350 kilometres offshore and then setting it down on the Grand Banks so it can start drilling and producing oil. So at our peak we had 7,500 people working here at Bull Arm and uh, many of them were from, from, from Newfoundland and Labrador and uh, they've been working safely for all that time and so we've had 40 million hours without a lost time injury here in, in uh, Bull Arm. The project is going to continue on drilling for several more years so we're not actually at the, the finish of the entire project. We've finished the platform now but now it has to start drilling to continue on. We're still on track to produce oil by the end of 2017, which is in line with our long-term commitment to, to all of our stakeholders. The hit Canadian musical, Come From Away, has cracked the Million Dollar Club on Broadway. Tip of North America, on an island called Newfoundland, there's an airport, and next to it is a town called Gander. The story, inspired by real events, earned more than $1 million in ticket sales this past week. 
Set in the days after the 9-11 attacks, the town of Gander hosted thousands stranded because of air travel restrictions. It cost about 12 million to produce, but is now one of the more profitable shows in New York City. A million tickets is a high benchmark, and some shows that made it include Hamilton, Wicked, and The Lion King. Great to see. Juno and Polaris Music Prize nominee Vasha Bulat is getting set to tour the province's arts and culture centres. Sharing the stage with her is Toronto-based singer-songwriter Hannah Georges. The tour is set to open tomorrow in St. John's before heading across the island and up to Labrador. They're, um, they're going to be doing a lovely version of a local tune. Just listen. Oh, how I long for those bright days to come again once more. First time I played St. John's, I was opening for Winter Sleep and they are a loud rock band and I was a solo folk singer and I stepped onto the stage by myself uh, without any instrument in hand and started singing and the whole audience started clapping in time, in perfect time. And I think that says a lot about how much music kind of flows through uh, the communities here and how, how much it's a big part of everyone's lives. Oh, how Yeah, I mean, I'm totally honored. I think Basha is just such a powerful musician. I've been a big fan of hers for a long time. And uh, I think she just shows what a force women in the music industry can really be. So it's, I'm really honored to get to play with her. Kind of tried to plan this trip so that I could see as much as I could and, and really kind of get into all the different towns and get as much as I could, um, as much time as I could. Traveling across Newfoundland and Labrador has been a long time goal of mine, so to combine it with music felt like I was getting away with something. <laughs> Come again, they never will, for now I'm 64. Well, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall are coming to Canada this summer. The Governor General made the announcement today. Prince Charles and his wife Camilla will be here from June 29th to July 1st. Their brief visit coincides with Canada's 150th anniversary celebrations. The planned royal tour includes Ottawa, parts of Ontario and Nunavut. It will be Prince Charles' 18th visit and the fourth for the Duchess. For me, waking up every day and feeling sad and going on stage is something that um, is very hard to describe. There's a lot of shame attached to mental illness. You feel like something's wrong with you. And, and speaking of royalty, life, Prince I'm William is tackling the stigma of mental health. He's turned to some American music royalty to get people to open up. That is Lady Gaga having a video chat with Prince William. She's teaming up with Will, Kate and Harry's mental health campaign called Heads Together.
Just enough time to show you our viewer photo of the day. Just in time uh, for Easter, uh, what do you see? I see the rabbit. It's a bunny bird. <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> Barb Parsons, uh, this is out in the Cavendish area. And now I see it. Yes, okay. Oh, it so took me a moment. Oh, okay. The head of the bunny there on the left side of the bird. And if you want to take a closer look at this, I've just posted it to my Facebook page. You can share it there. <laughs> Very just like nice. an Easter bunny. That's right, Lovely. just in time. <laughs> thanks very much for sending it to us, and thanks to all of you for watching. Have a great night. Good, Good night, night, everyone. Cheers.